My guest today is Claudia Aguila Barroso, a distinguished lawyer based in Mexico. Claudia is celebrated for her expertise in constitutional, administrative and human rights law. As the founding partner of Aguila Barroso Abogados, Claudia's almost all women law firm excels in impactful litigation and consulting services. Beyond her legal practice, Claudia's commitment to education is evident through her professorial role at her alma mater, Escuelo Libro de Derecho, and her involvement in Mexico City's Constituent Assembly. Claudia's dedication to societal welfare is evident through her advocacy in pro bono cases centered on education, indigenous rights, and gender equality. The parallels between Mexican and Indian cultures added a lot of depth to our conversation. So without further ado, let's jump right in and discover more about Claudia's journey. Hi, Claudia, a warm welcome, and thank you for doing this conversation. Hi, Emma. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Awesome. And I'd love to start with understanding how did your early experience shape your journey thus far? Well, if I try to recap in order of what influenced my decision, for instance, to pursue law or to get to where I am, I think it's like a sense of right and wrong that I had ever since I was a little kid, like <laughs> always like trying to get things set. And I remember like my teacher saying like, why are you always advocacy for everyone else or for others? Like mind your own business in some way. But I guess I knew as early as being like a 12 or 13 year old girl that I would be a lawyer someday. Maybe not in the right kind because you have lots of information coming from TV, movies, and it's not how reality works. So it's like <laughs> the first day I arrive at law school because the first thing you get to know is like everything you've seen in the movies, it's not the way it is. Absolutely. It's not the way it takes place. But I can't imagine myself doing anything different than practicing law or trying to get my influence because by doing or helping others get what they deserve, what their rights are. So that's how it started. Like I'm always fighting for what I believe others should have in certain ways. So any incidents or any anecdotes come to your mind and as to when the professor said mind your own business, but at some level, I think it was such a caring thought, right? I remember a teacher cutting a classmate's hair. He was a boy. He didn't even have long hair. And she would say, like, you have to cut your hair, which now seems like, why do we have to have boys with short hair and girls with long hair or the other? Because I've always had my hair short. And then I remember like I told her, why would you do that to him? And of course, I was sent to the office and I didn't get it. But he was like, I'm not cutting your hair. But I, I was like, why are you doing that? I remember I telling that anecdote to my daughter the other day and I was, wow, mom, that's so frustrating. But that's violating his rights. And I was like, OK, I'm doing something right with her. Although in that time, but the thing I most remember, because it was very fun, we were in the last year of high school, my classmates and myself, and a teacher arrived in the morning and said that tomorrow we will have a surprise test and a mock test about everything we've said. And in parallel, in Mexico, there was this uprise of the indigenous people in Chiapas who were fighting for the recognition of their ownership in the land. And it was this big movement that today is, is turning 30 years old, Movimiento Zapatista. And I remember that we wore this bandana in our face as the way they were doing. And we took like the class and they say, we're taking this class on our hands because this is not right. And we had like this mission statement that we read. Of course, it was me that the one that did it. And up to today, I've been friends with this person, with this teacher, and he always remembers that anecdote because he said, you were so strong-minded and you had all your set and you said why you thought it was wrong and everything. So I always remember those two anecdotes, but it was fun in that time. So when you entered law school, there were a lot of very early shocks and realizations. So what does that mean? Well, this was a lot of shocks. Like you mentioned, my alma mater, which is Escuela Libre de Derecho, it's been on over 110 years, mm -hmm. but we are only like around 4,000 lawyers 
that have concluded their studies there. So it's a very prestigious school of law. But like I said, I came from a very liberal high school education in which I was always able to raise my hand and I felt hurt. And this is a very traditional school. So like they are very rude and they tend to get mixed in between what being an excelling school means in terms of bullying your students. But I went into this big, humongous class with 72 people or more, and I came from a class of around 22 students, which that's a shock. They made us stand up when the teacher went in. Uh, we had to speak in a very fashionable manner. We couldn't be like just raising your hands and expecting to be heard. And that for me was a big shock because I wasn't used to it. And I didn't even feel that I had a choice like to switch schools. And I think that's because the way you are built is where like I would felt it would be a failure because lots of people change schools, especially the first year of law, especially in my school. You get placed day by maybe luck, maybe influence. But like just for you to know, we were 72 classmates in the first year and we made it to the second year only 14. It was very hard to see how you lose yourself, how you have to transform, how you felt so confident and now you are not that confident anymore. I think that was very, very hard. So you have to take a whole year and then you have your finals, which is just one exam or else with three people there, like judging you, examining you orally. You have to be dressed like a future lawyer, all seriously kind. You have to wait for the bell to ring, then you go in, you wait for people to let you sit down. But at least up to date, you think that builds character also. So it's a very complex combination of what should be done and what should and what can be different and what's really necessary to form a lawyer in the future. So I felt that the, someone cut my wings in a way through my university. Because I remember of myself a very confident student all the time. But then in my way through the university, I didn't feel that confident anymore. And that I have to come to peace recently. Like, you have to say it out loud that somebody cut my wings. I did lose my confidence. I have to rebuild it. I have to regain something in order to be not only a good professional, but also a good example, a good leader. Because if you do not tend to reflect on that, you cannot help others when they are in the same stages or your previous stages. But I think that was a very hard experience, above all, in school with the teachers. They usually tend to be very aggressive with women, passive aggressive. Uh, like they would say, I remember one would say, that I do not just use insults to refer to a women student. If she says something that's dumb, I would say an insult to the guy sitting next to her. She would say that. So it was like, okay, that's passive aggressiveness. Everybody knows you're referring to that female. Wow. All others that would say, why are you taking here the place of a man that has to provide for his future family? So you shouldn't be here. You should be learning how to be a woodwife. We had lots of those professors. And it was the 20th century. It wasn't like the 16th century. I even had a female professor that said that in that time, it doesn't occur nowadays in my school, but in that time, there was this non-written law that only 30% of the students would be female. And it was my only female professor in my first year. And she would justify this meaning by saying, this school has very few lawyers and needs to preserve the prestige, needs to be known as the best. And for us to be known as the best, we have to have lawyers practicing law. And women are not going to practice law. They're just going to hang their title in their living room to for their grandchildren to see them. And she was the only female professor we had. So when I even remember that, it's like, oh my God, it was the example. She should have been telling you, you can do it. Yeah. And that was hard. My God, it's crazy. And you also mentioned in our earlier conversation that 
law started very early just after high school which means you were really naive and innocent so how did you stay resilient where did you get that mental strength from to bash on i don't know i think mental strength comes from my mom's side like she's always been this strong minded individual for everything she sets her mind on she's a lawyer but she didn't practice law because she was a full time mom for me and my brothers and i even remember that she was this pampered housewife because my dad was very caring always like a gentleman like open the door and you know all that but when they got a divorce when i was in law school and she had to go out and work and she never even turned her back or turned into tears or said i was not going to be able to do it so she just said okay my new condition is i'm divorced i have to feed my kids and uh, i have to pay the for their school tuitions and she found a job for herself and then we had a working mom so i think she is a great example of resilience of determination of strength and she knows how to and for others to help others even though she was struggling and you must have had these conversation with her when the professor almost challenged you and you know to see whether you're totally there or not yeah and that was hard also because so for instance when what was happening in my school she would always say well raise your voice and it makes sense but it doesn't work like that up till now there are lots of things that are not okay and i even been trying to work myself i was part of the board at the school but i wasn't able to change everything that i would have liked to change because you have to change patriarchy and people are so stubborn so not willing to change things because they will lose their commodities they will lose their privilege i remember i failed one subject and i called my mom i was an a plus student all my life and she laughed she wouldn't believe it i can't believe it up to date but now i see it and it say okay it helped me build something i don't know what but at least like you are as capable of failing as as capable of succeeding in anything you do and it helps you put your foot in the ground also <laughs> that although you think you are like the most intelligent person that you did everything you had to do there's a lot of other things that can take you off rail and that's also a very important way of learning yeah i did enjoy it in the time and i think it wasn't fair i did turn a lot to my mom especially in those times she didn't have to tell us a lot she set an example i even think my brothers know what a woman should do they know that their sister their mom we've all done it my grandma has done it so i guess for them is no surprise to have women our mm-hmm. of all the time right you said it wasn't fair when you talked about the five minute fail yes right so tell me what do you mean by that well it wasn't fair because it was this mean professor and it was a subject called economy and he asked me something about criminal law so that's not fair you flunk someone because you asked something that not, has nothing to do with the subject and it wasn't fair because the school knew it happened and nobody did anything about it i've tried it myself a bit but he's still a professor he's a very <laughs> mean person <laughs> he's done much lots of person i remember having very talented classmates in the first year that left school just because of him they actually are great lawyers but they didn't finish school at my same school they went to other universities or to other law schools and i think they would have been excellent lawyers from the escuela libre de derecho that's why i say reality right because you get here you're a teenager you are 19 you get to your first year in law school as a freshman you have at least a couple of teachers ask you why do you want to be a lawyer and you go like because i believe in justice why do you think that's justice and they're teaching you everything but justice <laughs> they are teaching you the law but they are not teaching you how to be just how to give everyone what they deserve how to treat people with dignity i think that they didn't teach us and they suck in all the joy that the teenager has the eagerness the thrive that you get when you get to law to the first year instead of letting you bloom 
So you went like this young, idealistic lawyer, all set to, you know, bring justice in Mexico. And then you're not seeing justice in your learning ground. Do you think you changed as a person? I think I have changed, definitely. I've been changing a lot. And even like having this conversation with you is so fulfilling because you get to see your own life, your own path, which is something we don't usually do. Given that you came from a very rather liberal background, right? And, you know, with brothers and your father being very broad-minded and your mother being so strong-headed. When did you feel compelled to focus on diversity and representation? It's a great question. And I think I felt compelled to do it with these intentions less than 10 years ago. And I have to thank my students for that because they helped me see that there's lots of things that are wrong that they don't have to accept. And even that I was a liberal, I had in my mind that there are certain things that you just have to accept because you cannot change it. And I have some students, most of them female students, that believe strongly that they should transform everything, believe is not okay. I was at my law firm with my two female associates who had previously been my students at the Escuela Libre de Derecho, and we were taking care of this case before the court that was related to our school. It was like a favor from our dean who had called us and said, oh, you're so excellent lawyer, so please, I need your experience. Can you help your alma mater and take care of this case professionally? We said yes. Of course, it was a pro bono case. And we were succeeding. And one day, coming from the court, I entered my office and I had this big flower bouquet in my office. And it was from the dean of my school thanking me about the service. He was an old man. Well, he's my dad's age. I said, okay. And I just put it in my table by the side. And this female associate was so mad. She was, why did he do that? Would he have sent flowers if you were a man? He's thanking you for your professional skills. Why is he sending us flowers? I can't explain how mad she was. And she was this girl. She's always so nice and tender and not loud. And it made me think, and she was right. And she said, would he thank, and she gave certain example of names of men colleagues. Is he sending them a whiskey, uh, a scotch bottle? Would he send, invite him for a dinner? And it made me think of that particular scenario. Starting that day, I started paying attention <laughs> to a lot of things mm. going on that before that anecdote, I would have just let go. And I started paying attention in the classroom, in the meeting. I started intentionally raising my hand when I had a point. So it helped me a lot. We take it in our stride, I think. And yes, our wiser self just says, it's okay. What's the big deal? And these kids notice it. Yeah, I like the way you say it because they're okay. It's not a big deal. But you grow old saying, okay, it's not a big deal. And it's a whole bunch of big deal issues. They are a big deal. Or not a big deal issues, but they are constant. They are everywhere you turn. In the school, in the meeting, when you are to enter a classroom. Like, it happens up to now. If I go, you said before that I have an almost all-female lawyer practice. But if I go with a, an associate of mine that's a man, who is younger than me, we're celebrating something, and we usually do that in our firm. If we'll go to a restaurant, it's mostly women, and he is the man. Yeah. <laughs> when the waiter arrives with a bill, he will give it to him. He is so intentional that he usually turns to the waiter and he says, she's the one paying. She's my boss. And I see that the waiters turn all red, and mm. they don't know what to do because it's mindset. Mm, conditioning it's conditioning precisely that's the right word and that's how i became an activist because then you see okay this is not okay that's why i became board member in my school for the last four years and i tried to have more female professors because i think it's important the presentation counts mm-hmm. if you don't see a female being a lawyer how do you know what type of lawyer you want to be 
you, you cannot reflect on a white man in a suit, but you can reflect in a pregnant woman. That was another anecdote. I remember I was pregnant with my third kid, and I said to my students, I will grow fatter and fatter along the school year because I'm pregnant. Da, da, da. They all laughed on that. But I remember I had a, a student that came to me and said, you can't believe how comforting it was for me to know that you could be a mom and you could be a successful lawyer. And you showed me all that. Just the way you presented yourself to us in that particular class. So we all make an impression. Yeah. And we're not really aware of how important it can be. Because that day I was really joking. But this particular student came to me and she said, I was on the verge of switching careers. I didn't even know if I wanted to finish at the school. And she even remembered how I was dressed. And she remembered all that. So it's very important because I'm not a teacher until fourth grade. So my students have been previously three years in the school. Right. And they hadn't seen any professor, to say the least, a women professor, a pregnant women professor going into school. On the same note, you know, talking about your pregnancy, did you take leave when your kids were born? Were there any challenges? There were lots of challenges and I didn't really take leave because who was my previous uh, partner, who was previously my teacher and everything. We had this very boutique firm and I was the only associate at that time and then I became a partner. But when my first child was born, I remember I was answering messages from my client. Up until the moment I went into labor. And then it was a natural birth and I believed I could do it all. And I went home with my newborn and I said, okay, I'm not taking a leave formally, but I did stay at my house like for 30 days or so, answering emails and writing and everything. And I did that with my three kids. I only disconnected with my third one. And it was not because, I it was not immediately when she was born, because she was born in December 2nd, 2011. Everything was fine. I was in my house like two days after. And then she had something that up to there, we don't really know what happened. But she stopped breathing, so I had to take her to the ICU. And she stayed there for almost four weeks. And that's the only time in my life I remember really disconnecting from the world. It was the worst time of my life. She was fighting for her life. And it also changed me the way I see mothers, motherhood, and the act of giving birth. Because we usually tend to see it very romantic and positive way. Because we are very fortunate. And when I was in the ICU, I had a full-grown baby struggling for her life. I was just focusing on getting my girl back and healthy. And I didn't know what was going to happen. So it was a, a very important experience for me. I feel lucky because I've been able to both be a professional woman that my kids are proud of me. And I've never felt guilty or like I've abandoned them because at first when you're a new mother, it's like, should I send my kids to daycare or not? It's like, oh, this big guilt on top of you. but. Now, I think it's the best, especially if you're having an equal society. It's not my mom's job to take care of her grandkids. Of course, she does it lovingly and she likes to spend time with them, but they are my responsibility and my husband's. And my husband has also taken a very active role in this. And I don't think we have reached the point of equal because all the burden of the administrative responsibility of a home it's still on me. Now I have even my 15-year-old daughter once made fun of her dad because I was like, oh, I have to do the check-in for this travel I have to do. And he turned around and he said, why do you have to check in? I always receive it automatically. And my daughter, 15-year-old, she laughed. And he said, automatically, it's always mom who's doing it. And now I make fun and I sent him his boarding pass and I said, your automatic boarding pass. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So with the wisdom of hindsight, do you think you should have sort of gone through that journey differently? I don't know. You see, I had a privileged situation because since I wasn't my own boss, mm -hmm. I juggled with my time the way I wanted. 
So maybe I could have taken like at least a couple of months because of my body to take care of myself more than my baby, like to take care of myself, especially when I was my firstborn. Because I remember like trying to breastfeed him and I didn't know what to do. I was crying myself out. And I'm usually very strong and I was crying. What is this? Everything hurt. My mom would go to my house and I didn't want to have everybody in my house. I wanted to set boundaries. But going back to work so fast or so quickly, I think I'm privileged since I am my own boss and I've been my own boss most of, most of the time, at least since motherhood. I was able to spend lots of time with my kids, although I was a full-time working mom. I was the head homeroom mom for the whole ECC. And everybody said, how do you manage? Because I manage. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have done all that. Yeah. Because I tend to feel that we're super women and we should be there. And I took times like to the gym boy class and I did all that with them because I was able. Then I would sleep late at night because I was taking care of my professional. <laughs> I don't regret doing it. But maybe I would advise different to mm. the newly mothers. Maybe I would advise, like, take it easy, listen to your body, listen to everything. Because sometimes, like, we listen to the physical part, but not to the anemical part. Right. So me, I know I wouldn't have done it different. So you recognize that you were the superwoman, but it's not like you would have inflicted the same expectation, for lack of a better word, on your colleagues, your team members, or somebody you would have mentored. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, although you make me feel like, yeah, yeah, that's what I felt I should be. I felt for myself that I should be that superwoman. And I know for a fact I would do, do it again, <laughs> because I know me. Mm. But now that I hear you saying, yes, I would give the advice that nobody should be a superwoman. Nobody should be a superhero. And we should take care of ourselves before taking care of others. So taking a time, making a pause, and that would be helpful for you. And yourself. Yes, I know that. It sounds crazy because I know I did it. And I did it intentionally because I felt like it's so chaotic because you feel fine when people say, okay, you're a superwoman. And it's not a compliment. I think there is a huge natural tendency in people to expect the same behavior as what they are showcasing. And that's what I wanted to sort of double click on. Yeah. Let's shift gears, Claudia. So, you know, you talked about your partner who was your professor earlier and you took on the practice, right? So, how did you sort of then take the practice forward and what kind of challenges came your way which you had to navigate or address? Yeah, my previous partner who was also my professor and I think she's like my mentor, he changed uh, gears and he, he became a judge, a Supreme Court judge. So he took a different way. So that's why we separate our ways because at that time, at that moment, I was already the mother of two, so I really felt at the point, at first I was compelled that I felt that I had to follow him, and I think that was very extenuous because I thought to myself that how am I going to follow him, and in terms of being his equal, that would be like a degradation because I would be his secretary or like his clerk, you see, formally speaking. And at some point he said, like, you should stay, you should try on your own. And it felt liberating at some point because I said, okay. I remember talking to my husband and saying, he said that I'm okay. I could stay on my own. Which now when I think about it, it's like, I didn't need his permission. <laughs> I should have. Yeah, that. I was just going to say that, right? Yeah, yeah but it's that's... Really hard to realize it. That's why I'm telling you it's a journey of self-discovery. Yes, completely. <laughs> but always so evident. He did say that I would have to struggle or juggle with two different, two very, very hard things. One, that I was a woman, and the second, that I, one, that I was young. I know he didn't meant it in a bad way, but nowadays I also remember and I say, well, that's not that nice to say, because if you know that someone is not that sure, 
uh, or not certain, it's a difficult moment, and then you make her feel insecure about things that she cannot change because she's a she and she's young. So maybe it's not a nice thing to say, but I know him meant well. At least that's why I tried to think. But then I had to juggle with lots of insecurities. All those insecurities, am I going to be able to keep the firm going to build my own reputation, to keep my reputation? Am I going to be able to pay for others their salaries? So at first I was really almost having a panic attack. I never, never showed. I was always feeling like, will I be able to do it? And I think I felt like light for the first five years of my life. So it was like, wow. And it wasn't until one point, and I remember the five-year period of time because I was having a conversation with another colleague. Of course, he was a male colleague that once told me that, do you know that after a five-year period of time, you get the stability point of your firm? But he was talking about his experience. And then I realized, okay, I've been there for five years, and so maybe I'm doing okay. And in that period, I also got the invitation from the constitutional president of the country to be a constitution for the first constitution of Mexico City, which was a very important commission, not paid, but very important. It was very interesting. I got to participate in politics. So it was a very important experience. And that I owe to having myself being able to be on my own, having my own practice and having that opportunity. So it was very hard and still hard up to today because we have ups and downs. I think the first one was to believe you could do it. And then the second hardest point, I think it was during the pandemic, like to think, I don't want to let anyone go. I want to be able to keep my practice. I want to be able to keep my team. And I can say with really proud and joy that we managed. Up to today, I've managed. It's been hard, but I didn't have to let anyone go. Not even the cleaning lady who has awesome. been with us for all those years because I met her in my previous job. And I think it was very hard, but at least I can say that even if I haven't changed the law perspective in Mexico, I have changed their lives because they kept their job. They have their pay every single month and that makes me proud of the firm on all and of what we have been able to do in a very difficult environment context around the world but especially in Mexico City with the pandemic keeping jobs keeping offices open it was very very hard very interesting I know you don't like the word superwoman but how did you navigate all these different journeys with complete perfection. <laughs> I don't know about perfection, but at least with complete attention and with my heart in it, I guess mm. I did. I'm always full-hearted in everything I do. My kids, of course, are a big priority, but I like to take care of myself. During that period of time, I decided I wanted to run a marathon. I ran, ran Paris, Mexico City, Madrid, Berlin, and Chicago. <laughs> then I broke a knee while skiing, and then I haven't been back but I wish I can go back for my 50th birthday or so. Someday I will be back. So talk to me about the marathons, Claudia. I also know that you went and worked in Paris for a year or so before you got married. So is there a connection between all the marathons and all the different countries you've selected? What is the driving factor behind this running? Oh, maybe there is a connection now that you say it, because I went to work in Paris, in the Mexican embassy in Paris during the year 2000. It was a great experience living there, but I've been in love with Paris ever since. I visited for the first time during my 15-year-old birthday trip. And I remember to myself, I wish I could live in this country one day. And my father made that dream come true because he said, do you want to work at the Mexican embassy in Mexico? And I said, is that possible? So he helped me do that. And I worked there for a year. I came back because I had to be a lawyer and I hadn't presented my professional exam and defended my thesis. So I had to be back to do that. And it is connected because that year I had a friend there and he said, "Ah, tomorrow is the marathon. Would you like to run with me? And well, maybe it wasn't like tomorrow. It was like a week because we ran a couple of days before. 
And I said, I've never run a marathon. I didn't even have really an idea of what it was. So we were preparing like for a week. And the night before we went to have this carve pie dinner because we were going to run not the full marathon, but like 15K or so. And then something made me sick and I couldn't wake up the day after and I didn't run with my friend. He did finish up running the 15K and I never. So maybe that's connected. And then my husband and I were talking about running a marathon, maybe New York, something like that. And then when I went to Italy for some studies, I had a friend who had run like 15 marathons. And I said, okay, this is the time. I will go back and I will run a marathon. But I will pick wisely which marathon I will run. Because if I only do it once in my life, I want it to be worth it. So I picked the Paris Marathon. So like professional runners don't pick those, but pick like the big six marathons, which are the marathon majors. And of course, Paris is not one of those. But I said, I want to run in a nice city. And it was totally worth it because you start the marathon in the Arc de Triomphe and you run all over Paris, like Rue de Rivoli, you go to the Seine, uh, you go back and then you finish through the Bois de Vincennes, you see the Chateau. So it was totally worth it. Of course, I wasn't going to set a, a time record or anything, but I was aiming to finish it and to be able to walk. So I managed all of those and I really enjoyed it. And then we went to Prague. So it was a great experience. So then I decided I would run Mexico City Marathon. And it was also very intuitive because I said I'm going to run like half a marathon. But Mexico City has this great vibe during the marathon and in that time the finish would be in the in the national university and the vibe to get there is so so much powerful so i really loved it so i finished it and then i ran it was chicago and i took my firstborn my son with me because it was the weekend he would be turning 10 years old so it was like a gift And then I ran Berlin Marathon because I've never been to Berlin. I love that. (laughs) What a great motivation to travel, right? I think traveling and connecting the two makes so much sense. So thank you for that, you know, perspective. I love it. (laughs) Yeah, it does. And it's a great way to get to. Because if you're not running like to make the new mark in the marathon, you really enjoy the city. You enjoy the vibe. You enjoy the people. You get to see how the people interact with the marathon. What do you think are the factors behind your success? I think it's a mix of self-made factors and your network factors, because I think my family is a big pillar or a very important part of my success. I have a very connected and strengthened family, not only mom, dad, and my siblings, but like my grandparents were always there, my Grandpa recently passed away, but he was always there, a big supporter. So I think that's very important. I can't imagine being a successful professional today without my family support all the way through to get here. And also the opportunities that you take, not only that they are given, but that the ones that you take. I remember I wrote a letter to my parents thanking them for the opportunities they'd given me because being a Mexican and with the situation of the country, you get to realize that if I had finished high school in a school where I have been able to learn to speak in another language, where I had learned to write in a typing machine, typewriter in that time, but also to use a computer, I was able to drive. I remember I wrote a letter to my parents to tell them that just with those skills, without having a university title, I would have been able to succeed much more than any other typical Mexican without those skills. My parents not only paid for my school, which was a private education that helped me learn English at a young age. They also paid for my French classes when I decided I wanted to learn to speak French. They paid for my German classes when I decided I wanted to learn German. They paid my every single class I wanted to take, like dancing and tennis and being a softball player. And I think those are You can only explain your life and your success because you have this big network around you that supports you, encourages you, and gives you the opportunities 
to take advantage of. And what inspired you to learn French and German? It was very, sometimes I think that you have a mind when as a child and you have to broaden your spectrum but you don't really know how to broaden it until it gets to you. And I remember it was a summer. I was at a friend's house in Austin. She had invited me. So I was with her and her family. And they had this cousin whose father was French. So he spoke French with his father ever since he was born. But my friend's brother was speaking French with him. And I realized, that oh, you can learn another language. I remember it came to me like, I can learn another language because before that, I never thought I would be able to learn another language. Ever since I was in kindergarten, I was in a bilingual school. So I learned half the Spanish, half the English. Everybody was speaking English and that's the way it was. And my parents do not speak English. They only speak Spanish. So that's why I know it's an opportunity and I thank my parents because they gave us these skills. And then I remember coming back to Mexico and telling my dad, I want to learn French. And he said, okay, find out where you can learn French. And then I went to the Alliance Francaise and I learned French. Wow. So how do you manage all these things then? How many hours in a day do you even sleep? That's the good question. That's what I was going to say. I'm not a long time sleeper. I usually wake up very early in the morning, around five, six. I'm full energized and I tend to sleep very late at night, but I have restful sleep, at least like five, six hours. That's all I need. And I love to travel. So I think that's a good way to get full energy back on. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, that's the way I've managed. But I think the key to that would be like that I'm my own boss. And I can juggle with my times the way I like, the way my kids. Eat. When they were little, I had lots of time for them. After they left school, I was with them a lot. I took them to the birthday parties. I picked them up for their after school classes and then I would get them to bed early and then I would have a time for myself. But that's what you have to do. Well, at least for me, it worked that I had time that I could manage. But I always say that it was my privilege because not everyone has that opportunity to take care, not having to work from eight till five or something very rigorous. I was able to shift in my schedule. Claudia, I want to, in fact, sort of explore or double click on this, actually. It's interesting that you see having your own practice as a gift, right? The flip or a different perspective here is that you had your own law firm. So they say it's very, very hard for entrepreneurs to let go and empower others and delegate. So how did you create that balance? of letting go, of allowing your partners or your associates that freedom to sort of do the job? I think the answer is that it was very intuitive that I wanted people to be happy in the workplace for mm -hmm. them to be willing to stay for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So I take proud of, because my top team, my associates who have been with me for over 10 years now, I think they feel happy. They work there because they are happy. It's a happy place. <laughs> so they feel free to be the way they are, to bring their ideas, and they feel recognized at a point. I also think that it's very important to make people feel they are recognized for what they do and what they can give to the workplace and the workforce. So maybe it was very intuitive because I remember I used to feel happy to work where I worked. I used to really feel very, that's why I say it's like a luck because I felt lucky that I worked in a place where I felt happy to work because not everyone is that fortunate. Sure, and sure. Maybe that was intuitive because I wanted people that worked with me to feel the same way I did. So how do you believe the modern woman lawyer's journey differs from your journey? And then how do you then deal with the new generation? I think like the modern women's journey is more authentic in terms of how they dress, how they look, what they want to achieve in terms of they are not willing to just take what men give them. I think it's much more evident, at least for me. 
I see them that willing to make all women law firms or I'm just going to wear my hair blue if I want to or pink if I want to. Um, very intentional. I think they have the very intention of making a different way of going into the law profession, although it's not everyone, because when we talk about women, it's we know it, we're all different. And in terms of what I did, I don't conflict with them because they have helped me. Since I've been a professor for so long, I've grown at the same time, I think, for myself, that I've transformed myself with them. That's when I usually feel I'm getting older because I remember my teacher saying that I learn a lot from you, but it's so true. You learn a lot from the young people, yeah. learn a lot of them, of what they are willing to do, what they are willing to accept, where they are not willing to accept. And I think the most important thing of being a women lawyer, or I think any women profession in any profession, is to stay true to yourself and to raise your voice when it's necessary to, of course, raise your hand and to make yourself heard, because it's not that easy. For men, it's a granted, it's given. But women, we have to take our place and we have to keep it for us. So once you're there, you should always stay there and not like be willing to give any other else take advantage of what's taken you so long to achieve. So I think that's very important. And I think the younger female, the younger women, especially when they are studying, which is like this mindset they have, they are much more conscious on what they would accept. Or if not, they are willing to switch. They are willing to start their new entrepreneurship, especially because in the law profession, they usually like, it's very monetized at a certain mm -hmm. level. What I've seen, and I tried to talk about this with all my students is, the importance of pro bono work, because it helps you help others, but it helps you much more than whom you help. Because, for instance, all my pro bono work in education helps me turn into perspective what the privilege is to have a formal education up to the university level and what the lacks or the needs in our country are, uh, health issues, women's rights, everything. So I try to have the students think of how privileged they are to pay it forward, to help others. And I think there's much more, the younger are much more into it, into causes, into helping others, into switching jobs if they are not receiving what they need. So that's, I think it's also very important to keep them motivated in what you're doing. Very interesting. And before I end this conversation, What's next for Claudia? What's the 10-year goal? Or what's the short-term goal? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I have a straight answer for that because I usually feel like, whoa, what's next? But I think what I've been doing this winter break, I've thought a lot. And I think my next term goal is like to have my associates work grow in terms like to have the firm grow equally like to give it into a bigger, not bigger in terms of people, but like people knowing that we all do all these things that we've been doing, like pro bono, having my associates grow, because I think it's time for them, like to also get their new clients and to do something. So I know I have to empower them to do that. And in order to empower them, I have to make them feel that they have to. So that's one. And in a personal level, I'm definitely willing to to finish writing some book I've been trying to for a long time right now. So I'm willing to have it done for this year. Awesome. So I hope the next time we meet, it's to talk about that. <laughs> definitely. I think that sounds like a great idea. So thank you very much for this conversation, Claudia. It was really interesting to get a lawyer's perspective. And I really appreciate all your vulnerability in the conversation. Thank you, Anna. It was great meeting you and great, great to have this conversation with you. Thank you for being a part of this incredible journey with Atlanta Diaries. I have had the privilege of hosting guests who courageously shared their most vulnerable selves with me. And even if only a small segment of these conversations can champion the journey of one person, 
it will be worth each and every moment. And together, we know we can create an even greater impact. So I do have a humble request for you. If you found value in these episodes, please consider sharing the podcast with your friends, family, and on your social media. I would also love to hear your thoughts and will really appreciate if you could take a moment to leave a review or rating. See you next week for another inspiring journey on Atlanta Diaries.